Howdy. Howdy. Oh, come on. We can do better than that, right? Howdy. Howdy. There we go. Man, it is so good to be here with y'all tonight, and, and I just want to thank you all so much uh, for coming out here, and this is going to be fun. I can, with a room this wide, it's going to be like I'm watching Wimbledon. <laughs> For those of you that are also from Northeast Texas, like myself, that's tennis. Okay? Wimbledon. Now, look, we're going to be here tonight, and the time that we have together, we're going to be talking about a, a lot of big issues. We're going to be addressing a lot of concerns that people have, and rightly so. But I want to begin our time tonight with a question that I've asked from one end of Texas to the other. Who here is ready for Texan? Me. <laughs> okay, so let me roll let me roll it back a bit. Remember when I made you say howdy again? Okay. Let's try this. Who here is ready for Texan? <laughs> That's most of you. We're gonna get the rest of you. I guarantee it, but before this is all over with, we're going to get the rest of you. Well, as Daphne said, my name is Daniel Miller, and I'm president of the Texas Nationalist Movement. But honestly, that is not my favorite title. My favorite title is father, husband, Texan. I love those titles. And it's because of those titles that I do what I do. And so, if you would, please take a trip back with me to August 24th, 1996. Because August 24th, 1996 was the day that I made the decision to either win Texas independence or get patted in the face by a grave digger with a shovel. It's do or die, Texas or bust. And let me tell you something. It was not easy in those days, not by any stretch of the imagination. We underwent, those of us that were in favor of Texas independence, we underwent severe persecution. We were labeled as domestic terrorists and extremists. They called us every doggone name in the book. But you know what? We didn't care. The nastier they got, the more serious we got. Because we knew if that's all they had, then that's all they had. Am I right? right. Yeah. So for those of you out there that are maybe a little, uh, a little uh, nervous about the mainstream media referring to you as extremists and things of that nature, let me just be one of the old timers that is the first to welcome you to the club. <laughs> Because I'm going to tell you, I, in those days, I didn't feel extreme. You see, like so many people, I started out as a dyed-in-the-wool, red, white, and blue American patriot. I was raised in a blue-collar household. My dad was a Korean War vet. My mom was a secretary for most of her life. We had enough to get by but never enough to get ahead. And I can remember that there were times when I was growing up that we just didn't have. But one thing that was a constant in our household was every night we'd sit around the dinner table, we'd have the news on in the background, and there was discussion about what was going on in the world and especially what was happening in our country. And Dad being, a, you know, he was a, like I said, he was a Korean War vet, but he spent the bulk of his adult life as an iron worker. You guys know what kind of a hard profession that is. And I can tell you, growing up as a kid, a son of an iron worker, it's especially difficult on you because you can't go on vacation in any city that your dad doesn't point out some building that he built. <laughs> Not that he was part of, that he built, right? But one of the things that, that was constant was that dinner table talk every night. And I can remember 
hearing my folks discuss what was going on in the world and how it was impacting our family. And I'm going to tell you, if more Texans were open and honest with their children about how we were being trampled on by the powers that be, we probably wouldn't have a generation of kids coming up that needed cry rooms and safe spaces at university. <laughs> Am I wrong? No. But that being said, some of my earliest memories were going out and with my dad and putting up campaign signs for whatever candidate that he felt like he could get behind. You know, there's some father-son time. Some fathers take their sons fishing. Some take them hunting. My dad took me out putting out campaign signs. Not for himself, but for people that he believed were going to make a difference for our family. And time after time, I watched as he felt betrayed by those very same people that he had vested hope in by a system that he had gone out and fought for in the Korean War. The very system that promised him that when he came home from his service, they were going to take care of him. I saw how frustrated he was by how the VA treated him when he had to go for medical treatment. Something I'm sure that the veterans in here could probably attest to is happening still today. And I can remember the time when my parents made about a $10 mistake on their income taxes. And six years later, here they come. Knock, knock, knock. You owe us a whole lot of money that we didn't have to begin with. And those were really tough years. But his enthusiasm for change never wavered. He continued on that path. And as his son, when I became an adult, I did exactly the same thing. Went out, put out campaign signs, found people I could believe in, and time and time again, wound up got shot. Wound up disappointed and dejected probably where so many of you have felt over these last several months. And so I became an activist. One incident in my past set me on the path that I am on right now. And that is I answered an ad in a newspaper. Said if you believe in the American way of life and the U.S. Constitution, come join with us. So I answered the ad in the paper, and that ad was taken out by two brothers, not part of any organization. And it was literally me and those two brothers. Now maybe their choice of advertising in the newspaper was not the best, but you would have thought there would have been more people, right? But in that meeting, something happened. Something that I, I for me, I, I really believe that this is one of the most pivotal moments in my life. It's after some discussion and some banter and some debate about the way things are or were then, they said, look, here's what we want you to do. Here's a copy of the U.S. Constitution. We want you to go home and read it. And then here's a copy of the Communist Manifesto, and we want you to go home and read that. And then you come back to us and you tell us what our government more closely resembles. If I had the record scratch app on my phone, that would be the time I would hit it, right? Scratch the needle across the record. As Cold War kid, I was nervous about even being in, a, in possession of a copy of the Communist Manifesto. I literally, don't laugh, hit it under my seat on the way home. I, I don't know why, but I did, but I took their challenge and I understood the problem. I understood that all of those things, those principles that Karl Marx wrote about, 
and the Communist Manifesto had indeed manifested themselves on the alleged winners of the Cold War. I mean, think about this. Graduated income tax. That's Marx. Abolition of private property. Well, what, what is abolition of private property? What is property ownership if you actually never truly own your property and you rent it from the government? Property tax, anyone? But it went on and on and on, and I saw that in Washington, D.C., there was this semblance of constitutionalism, right? They draped it in the, the symbols of patriotism and history and the legacy of the founding fathers, but none of them understood it and did not obey it. Am I right? I mean, it's unbelievable. What an eye-opening experience. And boy, I fought harder. I mean, you want to talk about urgency. I felt like I just uncovered a communist plot to overthrow the United States government and I was freaked out. And it seemed that the more we pushed, the more we connected with like-minded people, the more we got out and shared uh, elected officials' voting records, the more it seemed like we were losing ground. Every victory that we thought we had on the federal side of things was met with 20 steps back. Sound familiar to anyone? Mm -hmm. You know, we think we, we, we think we have a reason to celebrate, and while we're celebrating and doing our touchdown victory dance, they're over there stripping us of more of our rights. I mean, you want to talk about frustrating. August 23rd, 1996. I was about as frustrated as anyone could get that really cared about how we were governed. I mean, you know, it makes you want to quit. But then I was introduced to the idea that Texas could become an independent nation and that we didn't have to deal with the federal government when Texas became an independent nation. <coughs> we didn't have to worry about those things anymore. And from that day, on August 24th, 1996, I crossed what I always refer to as the proverbial line in the sand. Because I was given a choice. I could go back and pretend like there wasn't a real solution out there and I could get disillusioned, downtrodden. I could keep grinding up against the wall or we'd do something different. We could reassert our status as an independent nation to raise our head and become a nation among nations again. A concept that was all to, that was totally foreign to me at the time became immediately the most common sense thing that we as Texans could do. Because you see, here in Texas, we still hold those principles and values of the founding generation in high esteem, don't we? Right. Mm -hmm. Those things still matter to us. You know, when the rest of the world thinks of America, they really think of Texas, don't they? They really do. <coughs> and so we have an opportunity to make a big difference in our futures. And so from that day to this, I have dedicated my life 100% to the pursuit of Texas independence. To go out there and to work like mad to make it happen. Not for me, but for my children. Do you guys mind if I, I share a personal story with you? Is that gonna bother y'all at all? No. Okay. Well, you guys know, we, we were, maybe you don't know, we were in Amarillo last night, and that was kind of the first stop for this particular swing of what we're doing. But I actually started out this trip last week. Uh, on Thursday, my youngest, my daughter, and I do like this, like she's this tall, she's 21 now. <clears throat> but my daughter was in Dallas having brain surgery. And uh, I, I got to tell you, as a father, when you realize your little girl is about to go in 
and have a doctor probing around in her brain, it gives you an opportunity to reflect on some of your life choices. And I couldn't help but think about all those times that I was working for Texas Independence and not there for her. And you know, you begin in those moments to second guess yourself. And you think, did I make the right decision? But as I sat there and visited with her ahead of her surgery, I realized that she wouldn't trade that for all, for all the money in the world. Because she knows that what I was doing and what we're doing was more for them than it is for us. You see, for those of you out there that are nearer to your last sandwich than your first, <laughs> like me, understand that what we do is not just for us. It is to give those future generations an opportunity to write their own future, to create their own destiny. It's not about us. It never has been about us. It's been about the future. Now I will say this, the opposition, those opposed to Texas, will tell you that folks like us, all we're doing is looking backwards. We want some return to the 19th century. And I'm gonna tell you tonight, that those people are the ones stuck in the past. Because Texas is not about the past. Texas is about creating a future and a safe home for the principles of freedom and liberty right here in Texas. Am I right? Right. Yeah. So this is why we do what we do. Not because we have some selfish motivations, sure, we win, we cross the finish line, we'll get an opportunity to experience some of it. But it's gonna be folks like this little one right here. They get to experience the fullness of what Texas independence could be. And that's worth it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about Texas. And let's talk about where we are in getting it done. You see, Texas is not most of the things the opposition likes to talk about. Texas is really about Texas doing something that would have the seal of approval from both the founding generation of the United States and especially the founding generation of the Texas Republic. It is us saying that our principles and our values matter enough to say we're going to embrace our right of self-government and we are going to reject rule from the outside by two and a half million unelected bureaucrats. It's Texans saying that no longer are we going to live under 180,000 pages of federal laws, rules, and regulations that if they were printed up and stacked would be taller than the San Jacinto Monument. Don't you think about the irony of that statement for a second. If all the federal laws that we live under were printed out and stacked, it would be taller than the monument to our victory against the dictator Santa Ana. What, what does that tell us? That tells us that we are long overdue for Texas independence. At least that's what it says to me. So as we look forward to making Texas happen. I want us to all understand the situation that we really are living under right now. But I want to do it in this way. You see, I also have asked another question as we have crisscrossed Texas. Before I, before I do that, let, let me just ask you this question. When you came here tonight, did you have in your mind already an idea of what Texas would look like on the other side of independence? Yeah. Can you tell I'm riffing, I'm going off book? <laughs> because I really want to know. You, you have a picture in your mind of what Texas will look like on the other side of independence, 
right? That's a vision. Let's fix that in your mind. And then I'm going to tell you this. We know that we have the support for Texas independence. We know we have the support to bring it to a vote, to make your vision a reality. Otherwise, we wouldn't be pushing for a referendum so hard. We could go back and look at the poll numbers. You know, 2009 when this was polled, we were just shy under half Republicans. About 45% of independents and 15% of Democrats thought Texas would be better off as an independent nation. Fast forward to 2014, Reuters Ipsos poll comes out asking if your state should withdraw from the union here in Texas. 54% Republican, half independent, 35% Democrat. Okay? Those numbers climbing, climbing. Third party polling today exists that shows that Texas, if it goes to a vote, will very likely vote to leave. Our internal polling shows that if we take it to a vote, we're going to vote to leave. But here's what I know beyond polling that tells the tale of the tape, and here's the question that I promised I was going to get to. We've gone around Texas after getting tired of getting asked every question under the sun about Texas. You know, because think about it, there's about a million questions related to Texas. What about my Social Security? What about veterans benefits? What about currency? What about military? That's great. We got those answers. Not a problem for us. But I got, I got kind of tired of having to answer the same questions over and over. And so this is what we started doing. It's a real plan. We're going to do a little thought experiment. So you remember that vision that I had you lock in your mind of what an independent Texas would look like. I want you to ca capture that right now. I want you to imagine that right this very second, that Texas was already a free, independent, self-governing nation among nations. Right? We didn't answer to anybody but us. We had control of our own immigration and border policy. That's kind of nice, huh? We had our own military. We had our own currency. We had control of our, not just our monetary policy, but our full control of our tax policy. I mean, everything. Our own passports, our own embassies. I mean, heck, we even have our own Olympic team. And we're going to smoke everybody. <laughs> this is the way it works. We're competitors. We like to win, don't we? Yes. So you got that in your mind, right? And maybe instead of having the Texas conversation, instead we were going to ask this question. Knowing what you know about the federal government today, would you vote to join the union? No. 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 Would you? No. 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 Well, good news, I haven't met anyone yet who says absolutely they would love to join the union. Even the people that hate Texas, when you ask them if they want to join the union, they're like, mm, no, not when you put it in those terms. So let me ask you a question. If you would not vote to join, then why in the world would you vote to leave? You see, the response to that question tells me everything I need to know. Because that, in a nutshell, is the case for Texas. I can rattle off every reason that Texas should leave. I could talk about the 103 to $160 billion annually that we overpay into the federal system, right? I could put it in nice, wonderful stories like, okay, for a moment, imagine that you go to a doctor and the doctor goes and he pumps all the blood out of your body. Then he spills about 40% of it on the floor, puts the rest of it back in you and says, there you go, you wouldn't be alive without me. <laughs> That's our relationship with the federal government. I could do that. I could talk about the federal debt, scrolling like a Las Vegas slot machine. They're printing money faster than they can make the paper. We can talk about that. But at the end of the day, in our very heart of hearts, every Texan understands that the path to freedom, liberty, and prosperity doesn't lie in Mortimer on the Potomac. No. 
It goes right through a vote on Texas independence. You see, Article 1, Section 2 of the Texas Constitution says these words. All political power is inherent in the people. Notice it didn't say that all political power is inherent in the politicians or the pundits or the pollsters. All political power is inherent in the people. And it goes on to say that the people have at all times the inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish their form of government in such manner as they may think expedient. We have the power, we have the right, and there is no constitutional prohibition against it. Article 1, Section 10 of the United States Constitution lists everything that states are forbidden from doing. Leaving is not on that list. Therefore, the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution means it is a reserved power and right to the people of Texas. So the power is in our hands. All political power is inherent in who? The people. Now that didn't sound very powerful. So we're going to do that one again. All political power is inherent in who? The people. The people. And who are we? The people. The people. Our future is in our hands. More importantly, the future of our future generations is in our hands. You see, I firmly believe that the next 100 years of history are being written today. How will those future generations look upon us? Will they look upon Texans as a people who stood up for what they believed in or for people that dallied about while the rights and the freedoms that we all should enjoy were taken away. Will they view us as we view those stalwarts from the Texas Revolution that stood and gave all in defense of independence? Or will they view us as the generation that lost Texas? Because that is what we're looking at right here. It's a decision point. You see, I look at August 24th, 1996, is that line of the sand moment. You guys know that story, I'm sure. The 12th day of the siege of the Alamo, understanding that no reinforcements were coming, Travis took all of the defenders of the Alamo into the courtyard and explained to them the situation. Gave them the option and said, look, you can try to sneak out in the middle of the night, go over the walls, you can try to sneak out. Or you can surrender, but understand, surrender means death. Or you can do what I'm going to do, which is I'm going to stay here and I'm going to do my duty, even if by myself was the implication. And with that, he pulled out his sword and he drew a line all the way across the courtyard in front of all the defenders. And I can only imagine what was going through their minds when he was drawing that line. But he drew that line and he invited anyone that would stay there and do their duty to cross that line and join him. It was a decision point. So I refer to August 24th, 1996 as my line in the sand moment. And folks, this is the line in the sand moment for the people of Texas. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Understand that we are not alone in this. It's not just the people that we know are going to vote for Texas independence. We've got legislative support. I visited with State Representative James White before I came here tonight. And you guys may know James's name. He's a Congress, or not a Congressman, but a legislator, state rep from down in Southeast Texas area. And he was one of the joint authors of House Bill 1359, the legislation that was filed that would have given us an up or down Texas vote in November. One that got shot down. One that got stymied by the political establishment. So I asked James, I said, James, I'm speaking to a crowd of phenomenal people tonight in Lubbock. 
And we're going to be talking about texting. What is your message for them? He said two words. Remain resolved. <clears throat> he says, he's saying double down. He's saying dig in. Because we have support, not just among the people, not just among grassroots groups, but in the very halls of government. Not just in the legislature, but in state offices all over. And not only that, we have support from liberty and freedom lovers in states that are not Texas. In Amarillo last night, I met someone from Michigan, from New Jersey, from California, and from West Virginia. Now, I know how we might feel about Californians coming here, <laughs> folks from other states. But I will tell you those interactions that I had with those four mirror what we are seeing everywhere. Is that people are coming to Texas in anticipation that we will be a free, independent, self-governing, sovereign nation among nations. They are coming here because their states failed them. They are coming here because they know that their state cannot maintain a firewall against what's coming out of the federal government. They know that when President Potato Head sends his volunteer goons to the door to knock on your door and say, we're here to administer your mandatory COVID vaccine, they know that their elected officials in their state won't stand up for them. They came here because they believe in the Texas that we all believe in. So it's not just those folks in other states. People around the world are looking at us, wanting us to stand up for freedom and independence. On Saturday, I met with a member of the European Parliament from Estonia who sits on the committee that deals specifically with relations with the United States. You know what he wanted to talk about? He wanted to talk about Texas. Because the eyes of the world are upon us. They are watching to see what we do here. Are we a bunch of blowhards? Or do we mean what we say? And let me tell you folks something. I'm going to put my money on you 100 times out of 100. Texas is going to stand up. And we're going to be free. And we're going to be independent. And then Daniel Miller can go spend some time with his children and explain to them exactly what this was all for. Because all I have to do is tell them to look around. If you're living in a free, independent, self-governing nation, you get to have legitimate policy debates. You don't have to have your principles violated by government edict coming from the halls of Washington, D.C. You now live in a free, independent, sovereign nation where half of our laws are no longer made by two and a half million unelected federal bureaucrats and a bunch of K Street lobbyists. Your future is in your hands. And I do believe that they'll appreciate that. So where do we go from here? Well, look, it's, it's super important, and I, I want you guys to really key in on this tonight. Now, you heard me mention House Bill 1359 a moment ago, correct? Yeah. So, in the years that, that we have been fighting for this, the, T, the TNM was founded in 2005. For the first four years of our existence, we focused on finding other Texans that believe like we did. Let me tell you, there was a poll that was conducted back then. I think it was around 2004, 2005. The, the support for Texas was in single digits. Single digits. Now, here's a good thing, good news. We have always polled higher than the approval rating for the United States Congress. <laughs> they, they typically are somewhere either just right above or right below leprosy, I think. <laughs> I, I picked leprosy on purpose. I slept in and had another uh, malady 
in another speaking engagement, so I've had to be very moderate. <laughs> My moderating for what I say is that the ailment that they are worse than. But that being said, we worked hard. We studied before the TNM was ever founded. We took two solid years to look at independence movements around the world. And let me tell you, there are plenty of them. One stat that always blew me out of the box was that at the end of World War II, there were about 54 fully sovereign, recognized countries around the world. And by the end of the 20th century, there were 192. Those countries did not fall from space. The earth did not get any bigger. Those were people just like us in this room tonight that said that we believe that the best people to govern us just happened to be us. And they did what it took to reclaim their independence, their right of self-government. So there were lots of models out there for us. And we took lessons from all of them. So we spent the first four years of our organizational life finding people like you. And what we found was that our experience in the field didn't track with what the polls said. We were finding people that would come up to us and say, we've been looking for y'all our entire lives. Literally, I've always felt this way. I just didn't know there was anyone doing anything about it. Well, that just happened to be us. 2009, we engaged the Texas legislature for the first time on the issue. They wanted to send a fist-shaking state sovereignty resolution to the federal government. Basically, it's the equivalent of a tersely worded email. And we said, okay. I understand some of you guys may be new to this whole concept of federal government trampling all over you. So we're going to give you this session. Feel free to send your tersely worded email. But on the other side of this, understand we will be back and we will be demanding a vote on Texas independence. And that's exactly what we did. And every session since, we've done it. Three times previous, we almost got the legislation filed. Three times previous, we were stymied by legislative leadership that did not want this question put to the people of Texas. But this session was different. We worked with State Representative Kyle Biederman on monument protection in the last session. And when things got ready for early filing, we went to Kyle and said, Kyle, will you file the bill? Kyle said, absolutely. I'm glad you called. Do you have the draft text? And then I put the phone down and went. <laughs> we decided. Finally got somebody who was willing to do it. And navigate around all the hurdles and roadblocks they put up. That legislation eventually became House Bill 1359. If it had passed, it would have done this. It would have established a legislative committee to begin the process of figuring out how we were going to extract ourselves out of the union, right? Line out every single thing that had to be done so we would have an exit plan. And let me tell you what happened. Word came down from the high command. Yes, I mean the governor's office. And I mean the Lieutenant Governor's office, and I mean the Speaker's office, and it said, this bill must never see the light of day. Now, good thing, Biederman had already built up some legislative support. Folks like the aforementioned James White, folks like Brian Slayton and Jeff Kaysen, Phil Stevenson and Steve Toth stood up and said this, we don't know how we feel on Texas. But what we do know beyond a shadow of a doubt is that the question ought to be put to the people of Texas. Yes. Don't you agree? Yes. yes. If we, even if we don't, even if you're not for it, can you disagree with at least letting the people of Texas vote on the issue? Well, guess what? Our legislators who swore an oath to support the Texas Constitution, including Article 1, Section 2, that says all political power is inherent in who? The people. the people said, you don't have a right to vote on this. You know what they were really saying? They were really saying 
that they're the smart ones and that we're too stupid to make our own decisions. That's what they're saying. And I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't put their IQ points in a bucket. I don't know that you could fit them in a bucket. I've had to walk the halls with those guys. Let me tell you something. I bet on you guys a hundred times out of a hundred. When I said that earlier, that's what I meant. But our message to them at the beginning of the session was clear. You either give us a vote on Texas in 2021, or we're going to have a referendum on you in 2022. And I said it, and I meant it. And their choice was to ignore the thousands upon thousands of calls they got from constituents just like you. They said, just give us the vote. We just want to vote on this issue. They denied us all. And they betrayed their feelings about all of us. And so we decided to do something that had never been done before. Because chairman of the State Affairs Committee, Chris Patty, denied the bill to even have a hearing. We decided to have a virtual hearing. We solicited testimony in the same format that the committees use, virtually. All submitted videos, all in the style of a committee hearing. And people told their stories about why they wanted this bill to pass, why they wanted to vote on it. And I'm going to tell you, couple of real interesting things about it. Out of that submitted testimony, if it had been an actual committee hearing, HB 1359 would have been the most testified bill in legislative history. Back to back, by the time all the testimony was submitted, the total runtime for all of those three minutes or less testimonies was over 24 hours. Back to back to back. No breaks, no stops. It would have been the longest committee hearing in legislative history. <clears throat> but when those videos came in, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt exactly why they did not want to even give it a hearing. Because what I saw was the face of Texas. Every face of Texas. One of the most eloquent defenses for the right of self-determination given by a 14-year-old Orthodox Jewish Hispanic boy from San Antonio, Texas. Absolutely crushed it. A high school sophomore who considered himself probably not a conservative, as he said, but gave one of the greatest takedowns ever of the, the nonsense about this being unconstitutional and illegal destroyed it, a high school sophomore. We saw every profession. There were veterans on there from World War II on saying that they wanted it. And trust me, those World War II generation folks, they know what tyranny looks like because they had to go overseas and fight against it. Every profession you can imagine Doctors, nurses, attorneys, blue collar, white collar, ranchers, farmers, teachers, everything that you can imagine under the sun, young and old, every ethnic background you can imagine. It was Texas, and it was Texas saying that they just simply wanted the vote. And that, my friends, is why that bill could not see the light of day from the political establishment. Because that's not what they say about us, right? Remember, we're a bunch of old white men, not what I'm seeing in this room, although I am part of that cohort. We're just a bunch of old white guys shaking our fist at the sky, at the clouds, at the TV, and we just don't like the way things are changing. Well, maybe they got that part right, but they got everything else wrong. Everything else wrong because Texans want independence. So we're making good on our promise. They denied us our voice. Now we're going to give it back to the people of Texas. So do you want to know where we go from here? Yes. 
Yes. You want to know how we make this thing happen? Yes. Okay. I'm going to let you know. But once you know, you're responsible. Okay? Number one, from the moment that we uttered our promise to primary or run candidates against these guys in 2022, we started recruiting candidates. Any elected official in the Texas legislature that did not march down there to the clerk's office and sign on to HB 1359 is fair game. We're recruiting candidates right now. We have over 40 that have signed up and growing daily. Our target is obviously somewhere north of 150, and I do believe we're gonna make that, and I do believe that there's probably somebody in this room here that may make that decision to stand up and represent Texas, because remember, if they don't represent us, then they can't represent us, right? I mean, they, they get by with what we tolerate. And if they run unopposed or unchallenged, then what signal does that send? that it's okay to squelch our voices with no repercussions. So it is our intention to go out and do just that, but it's even more than that. Because you see, at the beginning of June, we launched a campaign to give the people of Texas a vote on Texas, to give them a vote that they were denied by the legislature. In 2015, some of you may remember we launched a campaign based on something we found in the Texas Election Code. It's a beautiful thing, our Texas Election Code, complex, but there are some real interesting nooks and crannies in there. You know, Texas doesn't have citizen initiative like other states do, right? We can't say, okay, look, we wanna pass this law and legislature stonewalling, so we're gonna go out and get a bunch of petition signatures, we're gonna put it on the ballot, right? Other states have that ability. We don't, but what we found was in the Texas Election Code 172.088 said that we could go out and gather enough signatures and force a question on a party's primary ballot. It's like, hmm. well, let's think about this for a second. House Bill 1359 was essentially non-binding, right? It just created a committee. But if we're already going to be putting pro-Texit candidates on the ballot, what if there was also the Texit question on the ballot? So imagine this for a moment. Run this scenario. <clears throat> when the primaries come about, technically they're scheduled in March, but we also know that this is a redistricting year. We know that the maps will get challenged in the courts. And we also know that that pushes the primary date back typically. I mean, let's be honest, we just had every House Democrat get on a, a Nancy Pelosi's private jet and fly to DC to beg the feds to take over our elections, right? So imagine that's gonna get delayed, but we'll just say March for the sake of argument. So imagine being able to walk into the polling place in March during the primaries right there on your ballot is this question. Should the state of Texas reassert its status as an independent nation? Yeah. How are you going to vote? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, guess what? <laughs> Quite a few other people are going to vote that way too. As a matter of fact, based on what we've done internal polling, we could probably put one and a half to double the number of people in the primaries that normally vote because the Texas question is on the ballot. So it is our job and our mission right now in the TNM, and it's happening everywhere in the organization all across the state to collect enough signatures to get that thing on the ballot. Because once we collect those signatures and reach the threshold by law, there's no way they can stop it. And some people say, well, what about, I mean, it's not really binding. You don't understand. Once the people of Texas answer the question, then it sets in motion a chain of events that establishes that the political will of Texans is to leave. We want out. But more importantly, when you go vote on this issue and it's on a ballot, 
what if there's a candidate for state representative and state senator that you know supports your right to be heard on the issue and will carry out your will? Are they going to get your vote? Yeah. Well, it's got to be better than what we got, right? So it is a two-pronged attack. So essentially what we are talking about, folks, is nothing less than a political coup. Not of the, not of the, the violent coup. We're not talking about a military junta. We're talking about a two-pronged strategy that will, number one, allow the TNM to deliver where the Texas legislature failed and to give you actual true representation by people that will help make it a reality. That's what we're doing. And I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna win. And we're not gonna win by a little, we're gonna win by a lot. And there won't be any of this nonsense of people bugging out to go fly to Washington, D.C. to ask Joe Biden's help, because we're talking about taking the chessboard and flipping it completely over. We're talking about breaking the back of a political establishment that has maintained the status quo for too long that has allowed Texas to be trampled on by the federal government. And I'm sorry if you believe Governor Abbott's Twitter feed, he is probably the biggest stalwart against the federal government, but let me ask you this question. When our border was being overrun, when all of our border counties are in crisis and have been, not just for months or weeks, but for years, where has he been? When he had all this power that he could have done some things, right, he's doing them now, where was he? They have not represented us. They have not stood up for us, not against the federal government and not against the forces in our own state that would seek to render us as too stupid to make our own decisions. So folks, I think it's time we make some decisions, right? Yeah. 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 It is our line of the sand moment. I know that Texas is gonna be a benefit to every single Texan from a political standpoint, from an economic perspective, from a cultural perspective. And I know that we all probably have our individual reasons that motivate us to do it. But as we get ready to, you know, I'll do, I'll do the Q&A tonight, but as we get ready to part ways tonight, I want you to think for a moment, to step back and think about the bigger picture. Think not about the, the individual grievances that drive you, but think about the future that we can create together. A future free of a federal government that tramples our rights. Imagine waking up in the morning and not have to worry about what rights are being trampled in D.C. right now. Think about not having to worry about that. Think about being able to elect politicians that the top level office that they can achieve happens to be in Austin, and they're not auditioning for a larger role on a larger stage. Imagine the kind of representation we'll get from that. Imagine not having that extra 103 to $160 billion siphoned away to go to other states to fund social programs that we don't want, that don't benefit our people. Think about having that money back in your pocket. Think about the economic impact of having our money stay here and how that will allow us to completely 100% eliminate the property tax. Think about what that future looks like. And then think about the little ones, the future generations, that we can give them that opportunity to create their own future. And I believe that you'll be like me. You'll wake up every morning and you'll roll out of the bed with your backside on fire ready to do something, ready to make a difference, ready to write history. You know, I end most of my, my, my meetings with the words of Sam Houston, and I think I'll do that tonight. You know, Sam Houston, they, they love to say that Sam Houston was against Texas leaving the Union, but that was back then. I guarantee he'd be on our side now. He'd probably be pushing me down to get, get be the president of the organization, which would be fine with me, because then I could get a break. But after Texas was annexed into the Union, Sam Houston knew that some of his countrymen were a little bit disappointed about that. Because there were people like Lamar and others that believed that Texas was destined for something great. They'd been a republic for nine years, and man, it was tough. 
They were broke, but they believed. And so Houston said this to him. He said this. He said that Texas will again lift its head and stand among the nations. Sam Houston knew that at some point Texas would reassert its status as an independent nation. My friends, I believe that that time is now, and ultimately the question is, will you stand with her? I want to thank you for your indulgence tonight. I'm going to turn it back over to Daphne real quick, and then we'll get into some Q&A, but thank you all.